Last night I was able to see the latest Ghostbusters film, Frozen Empire. I love Ghostbusters. I loved Afterlife, so I couldn't wait to check this one out. So let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Let me know your excitement level for Frozen Empire. What did you think about Afterlife and the Ghostbusters franchise in general? So last night at the press screening, they actually invited the Austin branch of the Ghostbusters, which made for a fun set of people to interview after the film to get their thoughts on the movie. I'll share that later on in this video. One more thing before we get started. Today's video is brought to you by Audible. If you're like me and you like to read with your ears, not your eyes, I highly recommend checking out Audible. They have a massive supply of audiobooks. One in particular you might be interested in as a Ghostbusters fan. It's called A Convenient Parallel Dimension, How Ghostbusters Slimed Us Forever. This is an audiobook about the making of the Ghostbusters film franchise, but it also touches in on uh, the real Ghostbusters animated show, all of the canceled Dan Aykroyd Ghostbuster 3 movies. This is what I've been listening to the last couple of weeks in preparation for the new movie coming out. And you can get a free audiobook of your choice by signing up for a free trial of Audible at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. As a Ghostbusters fan, I do recommend checking out this Ghostbusters book. The link is down below in the description. And let's get started with the good. Heading into this film, one of the things I was most excited about is that in interviews, they said that this movie was going to be influenced by the real Ghostbusters, the animated Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters TV show that I watched on Saturday mornings back when I was a kid and had all of the toys for it. And when you look at all of the previous Ghostbusters movies, they're always about the Ghostbusters starting or restarting. You don't have a Ghostbusters movie where they're in action at the beginning, which was kind of the basis for the real Ghostbusters animated show that they are working Ghostbusters. And one of the cool things about this movie is right out of the gate, they're in action in New York City, busting ghosts. And because of that, this movie's actually able to expand the lore of the Ghostbusters in ways that really none of the previous films since the first movie have been able to do. So we're back at the firehouse with the containment unit asking questions about the tech. 40 years has passed. Perhaps there's been some technological advances, some changes that we can make with, with a few of these different things because we're building off an established Ghostbusters with this long history behind it, not having them working birthday parties. But this time, we're actually moving the Ghostbusters forward. Other nice thing about this movie is that we're really getting to incorporate our original Ghostbusters into the main plot line. They're, they're not just you know cameos that make a couple of brief appearances. In particular, Ray and Winston, are very much a part of the story, very much driving the action. Ray kind of has an investigation that he gets involved in. And then with Winston, because of where they established that he's this successful businessman, he's kind of the guy that's kind of the boss of everything at this point in time. So I just thought that was like a really cool direction to take his character and giving him something very important to do that makes, that kind of holds everything up. And there's some just nice little ways where they use Dan Aykroyd's character as kind of the, the proud grandpa that he realizes glory days are behind him and he loves that the legacy is continuing and that he still has a little piece of that action. He's still a part of this thing that he loves so much. And then they have a real nice way that they handle the relationship between Ray and Winston, where it feels very much like two people that have been friends for decades and have a very long history. There's one conversation in particular where it starts like it's contentious at the beginning. There's conflict there. And you're thinking maybe we're heading in one direction and then you realize this is just two people that care deeply about one another and they're figuring out their places in this world and how to relate to each other. And it's just like a really nice little moment between two of our classic Ghostbusters. And as, as I mentioned, like they, they really finally let Winston feel like a pivotal piece to all of this. Venkman, Janine, and Peck are a little bit more of extended cameos or bit parts, but each of them gets their moment. They get something that's nice to see them do, whether a laugh, getting in on the action, or in Peck's case, 
being dickless as he always is. When it comes to our returning cast from Afterlife, I mean, I think Paul Rudd is just delightful and a great addition to this franchise. He's just so effortlessly charming and funny and entertaining to watch. McKenna Grace, as always, is great. I think she's an amazing talent, probably going to have a very long career, but she very much feels like a young teenage female Spangler, and uh, she's dealing with some of the tension that comes with that of having been a part of something really important, but she's still just a kid and struggling with that. And she is smart and talented, but she's also immature and doesn't know her own boundaries. And so there's there's some fun things that they're able to do with that. I didn't find her uh, character arc and journey as compelling and interesting in this one as it was in Afterlife. But I think inherently Afterlife had a lot of emotional oomph to it due to the nature of that story that's tough to replicate in a sequel. We got a lot of other returning faces here, but we'll probably talk about more of that in the bad section, unfortunately. And then we got a couple of new people in here. One of them's Patton Oswalt. He's more of an exposition dump character and just a cameo, but Patton Oswalt is so fun at delivering ridiculous exposition with so much glee and joy. It's a nice little standout little sequence. And if you want someone to make a sequence like that interesting, Patton Oswalt is the kind of person to do it. But he's only in the movie for this one little segment. Kumal Nanjiani is kind of a, a more significant character in the movie. And once again, this is another guy that I just think is kind of naturally fun and funny and kind of can pull laughs out of little moments. And so I thought he was another solid entry to the franchise. His exact character and where they kind of go with that, once again, we'll talk about a little bit more in the, the back end of this, but I thought he did a good job. I enjoyed seeing him in a Ghostbusters movie. When it comes to a Ghostbusters movie, you want some laughs and you want some scares on the scary end. I think our villain here is one of the more ominous villains that we've had that just has kind of this imposing vibe to him, whether at the early stage where there's just this creepy egg that just has this sense of dread and doom surrounding it, or when the villain is finally revealed, just a little bit creepier, scarier than some of the other main villains that we've had in other Ghostbusters movies. And so I think it it, it amps up that scare factor just a little bit or the intensity just a little bit. Very lighthearted film, but it does have the spooky, creepy nature that you want in a Ghostbusters film. And then on the humor side to things, I think it's able to kind of consistently have little lighter bits to it. Afterlife, because of the thing it did really well, which was be this great character piece and be the most character-based Ghostbuster films we've ever had, but it's also inherently about the death of one of our beloved characters and perhaps his faults as a father. And so it kind of put this weight and heaviness on that film. And while there's humor all throughout it, it just feels like a emotional, emotionally weightier movie. Whereas this one, we're kind of off on an adventure, building out this new family. And so it just has a little bit more of that playfulness to it. And tying back to what I said at the beginning of this, this movie was influenced by the real Ghostbusters animated show. And there's a lot of things that just kind of come with that, where we're spending more time at the firehouse. We're spending time in an investigation. There's just kind of ghosts looming around a little bit more in this world that's populated by ghosts that are all around and we have bigger threats that pop up and we have government agencies and we have ghosts that we're knocking over with our hands in the middle of filming but it just feels a more lived in in the world of ghostbusters but that means it feels like we're doing real world building where some of the previous ghostbuster films it feels like all of the big exciting stuff only happens during the movies and as you're watching this film, it feels like there's this whole backstory of things that happened last week and work that was being done over the previous months and set up for things that could happen in the future. It feels like a world where ghosts exist and people are trying to respond in all these different ways. And so it just feels like a fleshed out mythology and lore. And that's something that I feel's kind of been missing from the Ghostbusters films since the original one. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna share audience reactions later on 
Everyone that I talked to in the hallway afterwards and the conversations I was hearing in the room were very positive. Now, this was a Ghostbuster fan, heavy screening of the movies. So these are people primed to love it. And they seem to have a really good time with it. But there, there are some problems with this movie. So let's move on to the next aspects of the film. And this isn't a good or bad thing. This is just information to have. There is a mid credit scene for this movie. It's not really a plot point. It's just kind of a continuing gag. It's mildly amusing. I don't really know what it what it meant or what it was implying or if it was just supposed to be a bit, but um, there is a mid-credit scene. And I'll throw this into the mix section, but one of the things that made Afterlife really pop was how emotionally resonant and heartfelt the film was with the plot line about Egon, a broken family, people coming back together. And this movie isn't like that. Afterlife was the most character-based Ghostbusters film we've had yet. And this one gets back to, you know, having a good time. There are family elements. There is a character arc there. But you can't go in expecting the amount of emotion that was in Afterlife. A lot of people will feel the absence of just how weighty and heartfelt the previous film was. From there, let's move on to the bad. And the big thing here is there's simply too many characters. We've got a bunch of our OG Ghostbusters returning. We got Peck returning. We have like the full cast of Afterlife returning, including Lucky and Podcast. We're introducing some other you know, famous comedian actors in as new characters. We have side characters we meet all along the way. And that just means you're so spread out. You want to give everyone something to do. You want them to have some tie into the plot, in which case you start trying to force in these many subplots and the plot just starts getting overly convoluted to make room for all the characters and have something meaningful for them to do in a movie that's under two hours long. So like as I was watching it, it felt like it was very heavy on Paul Rudd in the first 20 minutes. And then he disappears and we're with Dan Aykroyd for a long time. And then he disappears and we're spending time with a new set of characters. And there's a lot of that where it's trying to balance a few too many characters, a few too many plot lines. As I, I mentioned, Lucky and Podcaster are back and it just feels like they wanted to bring cast members back. It's tough to justify how on earth you get a 15-year-old kid in New York City living with a grandpa-aged man and tough to justify, like, why would Lucky end up in the position that she's in in this movie besides the screenwriters just wanted to bring the characters back? And so you just have those little things that start to feel a little bit too contrived to squeeze the characters into the movie. And since they're there, we have to give them something to do. And that's stealing time from someone else that is more interesting. You can see kind of what they're trying to do with it, but they're not able to develop it. There's a lot of those where things just feel a little bit underdeveloped. There's an idea there, but it's not developed. Like they had two, three movies of stuff and they tried to put it all in one movie. Finn Wolfhard, once again, doesn't really have much to do here. He has his own little mini subplot like with Slimer, but like it, none of it is consequential to the grander story in a meaningful sense. So wasted again. That's disappointing. There's a new character played by Emily Allen Lind, who has this relationship with the Phoebe character. And I, I didn't... I didn't think it fully worked. It just felt a little bit out of place with how the lore has been handled up to this point in time. So I just wasn't able to fully buy into it. And it had some implications. Like I thought maybe it was heading in one direction to kind of add, I don't know, almost like commentary or like exploration of ideas of ghosts and how they're treated. And it doesn't really do any of that. And so I, I didn't particularly care for what they did with that. And it, another thing that kind of felt underdeveloped, like it hit the plot beats it needed to hit, but it wasn't developed enough to be interesting. Along those same lines, the Kumal Nanjiani character has ties to this lore that goes back and shows this history. And I love that they did all of that. And if we had all of these powerful demigods and demons on the earth and centuries, millennia past, how were they defeated back in the day? And there's kind of fleshing some of that out of ways that I enjoyed, but then we start getting to like, let's play that out in the present. 
there's not enough time to build it out. So it just once again, kind of felt a little bit out of place. Some of these things where they moved things forward because we didn't get enough time with it. It felt we had to rush through things or just kind of drop them without working our way in on these plot points. Final one on here. It feels like it takes a long time for the movie to feel like it's really kicking into high gear. Like you're waiting for the frozen empire and the big threat to emerge. And that's pretty late into the film. It's a pretty long middle act of investigations, complications, subplots, new characters introduced, and all this before we finally get to, feels like things are going into high gear. As like a final thought here, I really like the big ideas of what they did here, the general premise of the film, the villain, the idea of expanding the lore. But this movie came out, or was supposed to come out just two years after the previous film. And even between those two films, Ivan Reitman died. So there's even some like personal tragedy in the journey to making this film. And I wonder if they just needed another six months on the script, just a little bit more time to like really identify these are the most important characters that we want to focus in on, fine tuning the pacing of the story and everything to just iron it out. So I saw this movie with a whole bunch of Ghostbusters fans Here's what a bunch of them had to say about it. What did you think about the movie? Oh, I loved it. I had a great time. I think it was awesome. No notes. I absolutely loved it. The, this movie is hysterical. Lots of good lore building in this. Uh, I thought it was great. My expectations were very low uh, going into most movies now that are re remakes or reboots. I thought it was a ton of fun. I loved Paul Rudd in the film. Having a movie to call Ghostbusters 4 is... Is, is something special after having only two movies for most of my life. Mm -hmm. And yes. I will say that movie was something special, all right. It was absolutely fast moving, fast paced, no slow points. It was very fun. It has a lot of the charm of the original. I mean, the OGBs have a lot to do in this and it, it's a great story. I loved every bit of it. We got a lot of callbacks to the original movies. They have great new uh, weapons and props and stuff. Yeah, McKenna Grace, I love her arc. I think she's awesome. It's a just a great movie. The film ties together very well. I had a stupid grin all all over my face that whole movie. It was wonderful. It was delightful. Absolutely delightful. Come out and see it now. Real quick, before I give you my final thoughts, be sure to join me down below in the comments section. Share your thoughts on Frozen Empire and Ghostbusters in general. Also, come back this weekend. I will be ranking the Ghostbusters movies, and I do recommend checking out that book on the making of Ghostbusters, and I do recommend Audible, and you can get a free audiobook of your choice at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler by signing up for a free trial of Audible. When you put it all together, I had a lot of fun with Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. I love that we're seeing the Ghostbusters in action, that they're expanding the lore, that we're getting to see our OG Ghostbusters at a different phase of life and what their friendships still look like. Few too many characters, few too many plot lines, and so some things weren't quite properly developed, and there were some kinks in the script, but overall a nice expansion of the Ghostbusters franchise and an entry in the series that I think we needed. Overall, it's a B on the entertainment scale and 8 out of 10 because I really enjoy Ghostbusters movies. If you're a Ghostbusters fan, go see this movie. If you're more casual, maybe wait to stream it. Be sure to join me down below in the comment section. Let me know what you thought about the film. Come back this weekend for my ranking of the Ghostbusters films. And if you like to read books with your ears, not your eyes, get that free trial of Audible with the link down below in the description. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much.